Hello, this lecture addresses the mechanical properties of structural steel. We'll start off with a discussion of the different rolled shapes and cross sections that are available for engineers, and then move on to a discussion of material properties like yield strength, modulus of elasticity, etc. Much of this will be a review of what you've already learned in your materials of construction class, but we'll use this as a starting point to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Let's get started. The structural steel that we use as engineers is available in a number of different uh, cross sections and shapes and sizes. Hot rolled structural steel is available in I-shaped sections, channels, angles, T-shaped sections, hollow structural sections or tubes, and as flat products like plates and bars. We'll discuss each of these types of uh, shapes or cross sections over the next several slides in the first part of this presentation. Rolled I-shaped sections come in four different variants that are designated as a W, S, M, or HP. The W stands for wide flange shape, the S stands for standard shape, M stands for miscellaneous, and the HP stands for H-shaped pile or H-pile. So the letters are followed by uh, two numbers. The uh, first number is the nominal depth of the section in inches, and the second one is the weight of the section in units of pounds per foot. So for example, a W14 by 120 is a wide flange shape that is nominally 14 inches deep and weighs 120, foot, uh, uh, 120 pounds per foot. Now be aware though that the depth is just the nominal depth, not the actual depth. So while 14 by 120 has a nominal depth of 14 inches, the actual depth is 14.5 inches. Okay, wide flange shapes are the de facto structural members for steel buildings. So they're the, uh, uh, the buildings that are the uh, shapes that are used most often. And they have essentially parallel inner and outer flange surfaces. So the flanges have a constant thickness over the width of the flange. There's another uh, characteristic about W shapes that makes them uh, uh, quite uh, well suited for building design. That is the T dimension of all W shapes within a given group is the same so that it permits section changes with uh, different weights that when spliced together have a common inside surface for the flanges. So the T dimension of W shapes is illustrated here. This is a figure out of the AISC manual where you would look up the properties of uh, uh, rolled sections. And the T dimension is basically the distance from the inside of one flange to the distance uh, to the inside of the adjacent flange. Now it does include some of the fillet between the web and the flange of the section, but basically it's the distance between the inside surfaces of the flanges. So if you take a look at uh, one of the pages out of uh, uh, the W sections uh, in the AISC manual, you can see that for different groups of um, W14 shapes, for example, here, they all have a T dimension of 10 inches. Down here, this group all has a T dimension, of basically one and seven eighths, et cetera, et cetera. That's important because when you stack these members on top of each other, like you would in a, uh, um, a column tree, like we have shown here, the inside faces or the inside surfaces of the flanges all line up. So there's a common plane here and there's a common plane over here, and that makes the uh, detailing or the uh, connection design uh, much easier when you uh, um, use members that have common T dimensions. So that's why W flanges are well suited for building members. Now this figure actually comes out of the AISC detailing manual. And uh, if this was a face-to-face -face class, I would have a copy of it and I would pass it around for you guys to take a look at. But basically I just want you to know that there is a separate manual uh, for detailing of steel construction. And it gives the different conventions that you would use for putting together a drawing package for fabrication or for erection of steel structures. A lot of good stuff in there. It's not nearly as expensive as the uh, the uh, manual of steel construction. Uh, the detailing manual, I think, is uh, probably around uh, 50 bucks. Um, and uh, you could probably find a PDF copy online if you looked. 
So this shows another column of splice. Um, the one that we looked at uh, in the previous slide was a welded splice. This one is a bolted splice, which uh, creates a little bit of a different uh, arrangement. So in this situation, you can see that there's still a common plane between the inside surfaces of the flanges of the section above and the section below. Um, but in this case, there's uh, uh, a gap that needs to be accommodated. If we look at the outside surface of the flange for the section below and the outside surface of the section above, there's this gap in between there that needs to be uh, filled up with something. So you use an extra plate of steel, an extra piece of steel, and you would call that a filler or a fill plate. And you use those uh, basically just to accommodate gaps that uh, arise when you join different members together. This is a, another image, uh, three images actually, that come off of steelconstruction.info. This is a, uh, uh, a European website. I think it's from the United Kingdom. And uh, instead of calling them fill plates over there, they call them pack plates or packs. But similar idea, you're just using extra steel that's really not there for a structural purpose. It's basically there just to take up space so that when you bolt it together, you don't end up with bending and warping of the plates. Okay, a second type of I-shaped section that we deal with is an S-shape or a standard shape. American standard beams have flanges that are variable in thickness. The inner surface of the flange has a slope of 2 to 12 or 16.67%. Uh, both the depth and the T-dimensions of all S-shapes within a group are the same to permit section changes. And these are used mostly in overhead crane systems. We won't use them very much at all in this class. We might have the odd example problem where we put an S shape in instead of a W shape. Um, right, so. Okay, H piles or HP shapes are also used from time to time. Um, they're similar to W shapes, except that uh, with an H pile section, the flanges and the web have the same thickness. With a W shape, the flanges are always thicker than the web, but with an H pile shape, the flanges and the web have the same thickness. So like W shapes, the T dimension of all HP shapes is the same uh, to permit section changes with different cross sections. And they're used primarily for substructures or foundation work. So piles, retaining walls, foundations, things of that nature. Miscellaneous I-shaped sections are also used when, and uh, these are basically just I-shaped sections that don't meet the criteria uh, for W, uh, HP, or S sections. Miscellaneous sections are not used that often in structural engineering. They might be used for non-structural applications, like maybe uh, stairwells or things of that nature. Channels are also used fairly often in steel, though not as often as W shapes. Um, and uh, they come in two different varieties, a C shape and an MC shape. A C shape is known as an American standard channel, and uh, it has flanges that have uh, variable thickness, much like the standard I shape or the S shape. The inner surfaces have a slope of 2 to 12 or 16.67%. MC uh, shapes or miscellaneous channels are shapes that have flanges with a slope other than 16.67% on their inside surface. So just like uh, W shapes or I shape sections, the channels are designated by either a C or an MC, followed by the depth of the section in inches and the weight of the section in units of pounds per foot. So for example, a C 12 by 30 is a channel that's 12 inches deep and weighs 30 pounds per foot. The uh, Difference is that, um, one difference rather, is that when you look at the depth of a channel as uh, nominally 12 inches deep, it's actually 12 inches deep. So that's uh, a little bit different than uh, with W shapes. And uh, it doesn't make any sense. There's no really uh, congruity there, but uh, you'll get used to it uh, after you start working with them. So all C and MC shapes within a different group also have the, uh, the same flange thickness and T dimension as well. Uh, the only difference really is the flange width and the thickness of the web. Okay, angle sections are used uh, quite often as well. Um, angles have legs that have the same thickness on both legs. Uh, you can't find a rolled angle in the AISC manual that has uh, two different thicknesses for the two different legs. 
They can have the same uh, leg width or they can have different leg widths depending on the particular uh, angle you're designing with. And the designation here is an L followed by three letters. The uh, first is the, the first, uh, not three letters, three numbers. The first number is the first leg width, the second number is the second leg width, and the third number is the thickness. So the angle that's shown here on the left would be an L six by six by three quarters. And the angle that's shown to here on the right would be an L six by four by five eighths. So the longer leg uh, is the first number that appears in the designation. And the angle that's shown here on the left would be an equal leg angle. Angles are often used in pairs, and when they are, they're designated as two L's, uh, two L something by something by something. Um, and uh, they're used in pairs often enough that the, you actually have properties tabulated in the AISC manual for pairs of angles in addition to just single angles. So um, you can uh, arrange unequal leg angles uh, two different ways. Uh, when you arrange them with the longer legs back to back, they're designated as LLBB, long legs back to back. When you or arrange them the other way, they're designated as SLBB, short legs back to back. And then often on drawings, you'll see them designated as uh, long legs vertical or uh, short legs horizontal or something like that, or long legs in the plane of the frame. You'll see that note fairly uh, common, uh, commonly on uh, uh, structural steel drawings. T-shaped sections are also used uh, with some uh, regularity in, in steel buildings. And uh, T's are formed by splitting or cutting in half uh, a parent I shape. So you can take a W shape, an M shape, or an S shape and split it in half uh, along its length at the mid depth of the web and you end up with a T-shape. So uh, for example, if you take a W36 by 210 and you cut it in half at the mid-depth of the web along its length, then you end up with a WT18 by 105. So 36 divided by 2 is 18, 210 divided by 2 is 105. Hollow structural sections are another common uh, shape that uh, you'll find in, in steel buildings. Um, they come in square sections, rectangular sections, and round sections. So um, they're designated for rectangulars and rounds as HSS B by H by T. And for round sections, they're designated as HSS D by T. So uh, B is the breadth of the section or the width, H is the height, and T is the thickness. And then D, of course, would be the diameter for a round section. So one interesting characteristic is that uh, um, when manufacturers roll these uh, or ma make these uh, HSS members, often called tube steel, by the way, uh, or for tubes, the, uh, they make them out of uh, flat stock. And they, there's a tolerance on the thickness. If you have, say, a one inch thick uh, tube, it doesn't necessarily have to be one inch. It could be, I'm making up numbers here, it could be as thin as 0.93 inches, or it could be a little bit over thickness, uh, say 1.05 inches in thickness. There's a tolerance range on that. So the uh, manufacturers have gotten good enough that they can actually target the low end of the tolerance. So if they're going to make a tube that's, uh, say, nominally a 10 by 12 by 1 inch tube, they don't actually buy steel that's 1 inch thick. They buy steel that's 0.93 inches thick. So they can save money on the steel and still satisfy the letter of the law, so to speak, with the specifications for the tubes. So as designers, we have to keep that in mind. Um, when we design a tube that uh, has a nominal thickness, say of one inch, we actually use a smaller thickness, 93% uh, of that or 0.93 inches for that thickness. And we'll reinforce this with some examples that uh, will work uh, as we go through the, the semester. So the way tubes are made um, are to take a piece of flat stock and then uh, through a series of rolling uh, mills, rolling stands, you actually bend that from a piece of flat, shown as illustration number one, into a U-shaped uh, section, shown as number two. Finally, and close that up and then they have a resistance weld on one face of the section where the tube is actually welded together. There's a, a video uh, from, I think it's Atlas Tube, that shows uh, the manufacturing process. That's a pretty cool video. I would encourage you to take a look at that. 
Um, and if you're ever in uh, one of the big box stores like uh, Walmart or Home Depot or something like that, you can go up to these uh, columns that are exposed and you can actually look at uh, all four faces and you can find the weld on one of the four faces of that of that shape. Okay, pipe sections uh, are occasionally used in, st in structures. Pipe sections are available in three different grades, either standard, extra strong, or two extra strong, double extra strong. And uh, those are basically the weight classes for the pipes. Um, the the uh, designation for a pipe section is the nominal diameter and then the, the, uh, the weight class. Um, so they're available up through uh, 12 inch diameter. NPS stands for nominal pipe sizes. And uh, pipes, just like HSSs, are uh, rolled with wall thicknesses that are um, actually 93% of the nominal. So pipes and tubes, um, you can find some of them that have the same dimensions. Um, uh, so you might find an HSS uh, 12 by something that has the same diameter as a pipe that has the same thickness. Um, but um, typically the HSS member is going to be a better steel. They're rolled to, to different uh, uh, tolerances and things of that nature. So pipes are fine in a lot of cases, uh, used as a post, maybe in a small building, uh, but an HSS is fundamentally just a, a better steel and a better member. We use flat rolled products so quite a bit in uh, structural steel buildings. Um, and this is a table that gives us the proper terminology to use for those, uh, those products. So uh, if you have a, a flat piece of steel, it could be a strip, could be a sheet, could be plate, or could be a bar. Uh, just all different names for the same thing, depending on how thick the, the product is or how uh, wide the product is. Structural steel is considered to be anything that's a quarter inch or thicker. So the thinner steel products are referred to as a strip or sheet uh, with a thickness less than 0.23 inches here or a quarter of an inch roughly. And those are the types of uh, uh, steel products you're going to make a car out of or um, washing machines, things of that nature. Um, products that are a quarter inch or thicker are available either as bars or plates. So if you have a width that's less than eight inches, you call it a bar. If you have a width that's uh, greater than eight inches, you call it a plate. When you specify plates and bars, you should uh, use these increments for the plate thickness. If the thickness of the uh, 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 plate or bar is less than or equal to 3 eighths, you specify it in 16 inch increments. Uh, between 3 eighths and 1 inch in thickness, you specify in eighth inch increments. If you have a thickness greater than 1 inch, then you go to quarter inch increments. And so you, uh, you wouldn't want to order a plate that is uh, two and three sixteenths inch thick, for example. You wouldn't be able to get that um, and you would uh, expose yourself as somebody who doesn't know much about steel. So instead of ordering two and three sixteenths, you would bump that up and you would order two and a quarter inch thick. Uh, bar th uh, thicknesses, I'm sorry, uh, are specified in eighth inch increments and bar width are specified in quarter inch increments. Okay, dimensional tolerances also exist for rolled sections um, and uh, they govern everything from the depth of the section to the flange width and then uh, whether or not the web is at the center of the section. And I've seen that firsthand with some uh, laboratory experiments uh, that we were running. We ordered some specimens in and uh, I uh, uh, rather foolishly assumed that the web of the cross section would be right at the center of the flanges and it wasn't and that created some problems with detailing. So um, the depth of the section could be plus or minus an eighth of an inch. Uh, the, the flange width could be as much as a quarter inch over or three sixteenths under and the web is allowed to be off center. Um, so these create problems with detailing and you have to allow for the members to be uh, uh, within these tolerances. I've been on job sites where I've seen uh, iron workers with great big sledgehammers uh, uh, trying to fit a, a cross section in between two plates because the detailer or the engineer didn't allow for the possibility that the section could be an eighth of an inch deeper than it was really called out in the manual. Okay, there's some other characteristics. Um, these are all covered in ASTM A6, by the way, but the, uh, uh, the most important parts of that are included in chapter one of the AISC steel manual. So 
You also have uh, tolerances on how parallel the flanges have to be to each other. And so that's <laughs> interesting as well when you go in and try and uh, fit two pieces of steel together. Okay, camber and sweep are important. Um, sometimes we provide these on purpose. Sometimes they're uh, provided to us uh, free of charge. So uh, basically camber and sweep are just uh, um, variations of the member's uh, axis with respect to a theoretical line. So if the member is bent about its strong axis, about the X axis, then it's referred to as a camber. If the member is bent about its weak axis or the Y axis, then it's referred to as a sweep. Okay, then uh, here's a tolerance for angles. Um, you know, angles are supposed to be uh, 90 degrees when you look at an L, uh, but they're not always perfect. So it gives you a tolerance for how, uh, uh, how out of 90 degrees an angle can be. Another category of steel products for structural applications is cold form steel. Structural shapes of this type are created by bending thin material, such as sheet or strips, or sometimes plates, into the desired shape without reheating them first. Okay, because of the uh, thinness of the cross-sectional elements, uh, the design of these members are typically governed by uh, instability or buckling. And uh, that's something that's uh, unique about cold form steel. When we look at hot rolled steel sections, then uh, we worry most. Uh, we worry uh, to a much greater extent about things like yielding or developing the yield moment or plastic moment of a cross section in bending. But when we look at cold form steel members, the uh, the design problem is all about buckling. Okay, one of the advantages of cold form steel is that uh, you can get just about any conceivable shape manufactured because it's easy to work with. Um, you can also get a higher yield point from in the steel from the cold working, but this uh, higher yield strength comes at the expense of a reduction in ductility. So we're not going to talk too much about cold form steel in this class. Uh, most of what we do is going to be uh, a hot rolled steel. The image here, uh, borrowed from the website it's shown at the bottom of the slide, shows a combination of hot rolled and uh, cold form steel. So if you uh, look at this, the, uh, the beam here and the column here are going to be hot rolled sections. The, the reason they show up as silver is because they've been sent through a galvanizing process. And then the, uh, these sections here are cold form steel members that are used as secondary. And uh, one way, I don't know if this is a two, this could be an HSS here, or it could be a cold form section. I can't see the backside to know for sure. It's screwed in, so it's probably a cold form section. And then here is a, a, a tray for cold form and then a stud. Basically cold form steel to a large extent is used to replace members that would conventionally have been made out of wood. Um, it's uh, lighter than uh, an equivalent wooden shape and uh, is uh, also uh, more durable as well. It's not so, uh, not, it doesn't rot. It's not uh, uh, susceptible to termites and things like that. This is an expansion on the Jungle Gyms facility in uh, Fairfield, and uh, they're putting a new bay in, and this shows a good combination of uh, both cold form and hot rolled product. You can see the main members here are hot rolled. Um, they're actually plates that are. Uh, welded together to form eye shapes so they're tapered so they can't be rolled but then up here in the roof system you can see some cold form sections so if we zoom in on the roof you can see that there uh, are cold formed uh, z-shaped sections that's a z-shaped section there 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 and there that form the uh <clears throat> the uh framing for the roof. Now there's also some hot rolled sections here. Here's a, a W shape or maybe it's a miscellaneous, probably W shape. And that frames in this uh, part of the uh, roof here. And my guess is that that's going to support something heavier like uh, maybe a rooftop uh, heating unit or air conditioning unit or something like that. So they needed something that was stronger. So they used hot rolled sections in that area instead of cold form sections. This slide shows some common uh, shapes that are used in cold form steel. Um, so up here you have channel sections. Uh, let's see. 
So they come in three different varieties. Uh, you have a channel on the left, you have a lift channel uh, in the center, and then you have a sigma shape or lift sigma on the right there. So these are lips. And those lips actually uh, act as stiffeners to increase the buckling resistance of that member. Uh, up here, you have a Z-shaped uh, section. So you have a, a, a Z on the left, a lip Z in the center, and then a lip that sloped Z on the right. Down here, <clears throat> excuse me, down here in the lower left, you have a couple of different angles. You have an L section and a lift L. And then here you have a, uh, a hat section, and then you have a lift hat over here. Now, there are other uh, cold form sections available. There's uh, catalogs you can get for them. Um, but for the most part, we're not going to deal with cold form steel. Uh, one exception to that is um, metal decking. Uh, we're going to use metal decking quite a bit in our uh, 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 project and in some of our example problems. Metal decking is a cold form product, so that's one exception. Okay, we're going to shift gears a little bit now and talk about the uh, mechanical properties, not necessarily the ge geometric properties of steel. And we have some definitions to start that conversation off with. Um, strength is the ability of the material to withstand stresses resulting from applied loads. Uh, stiffness is the ability to sustain the loads without uh, too much elastic deformation. So if a member is stiff, it will bend less. It'll have less deflection under load than if it was flexible. Ductility is the ability of the member or the material to sustain inelastic deformations before it fractures. So ductility is uh, basically after it starts to yield, but before it actually fails. That's the measure of ductility. And it's important to us because it provides warnings uh, to the occupants of the building that something is wrong and that they should leave the building before it actually collapses or fails. Toughness is uh, defined as the area under the stress strain curve for the material, and it's used as a measure of the energy absorption per unit volume for the material. So <clears throat> when we design steel, um, structural steel, we, we design for yielding, we design for fracture, and we design for buckling, loosely speaking. There's other considerations, but... And uh, toughness is an example, uh, is a parameter that... Uh, gives us an indication of the fracture resistance of a uh, material. Hardness is the ability of the material to resist abrasion. And that's not necessarily something that we look for in structural steel, um, because when you increase the hardness, then you generally reduce the ductility. And for us as structural engineers, having a higher ductility is more important than having a high hardness. So uh, a, uh, a hard steel would be important if you were designing tools, for example, like a wrench or a hammer or something like that. You might need uh, the hardness might be more important to you in that case than uh, ductility would. Notch toughness is uh, another uh, measure of the ability to uh, resist fracture. It's the ability to absorb a sudden stress increase uh, without without fracturing. And in theory, you guys in your materials of construction class have all seen a Sharpie V-notch test, and uh, the, uh, the which is the basis we use to measure the, the toughness or CVN, Sharpie V-notch test. Uh, weldability is uh, another uh, characteristic of the steel, and uh, that's the ability of the steel to be welded without having uh, imperfections in it. And uh, in order to improve the weldability of steel, we adjust the chemistry, we adjust the hardness, uh, toughness, etc. And then finally, corrosion resistance is another consideration. Um, by adjusting the chemistry of the steel, we can make it uh, less susceptible to rusting. Uh, weathering steels like A242 or A588, uh, they actually develop a thin layer of rust that's called a patina that protects the remaining steel from further corrosion. And we can uh, um, impart these characteristics by adding additional copper or nickel or chromium uh, to the, uh, to the uh, chemistry of the steel, and uh, that gives us weathering steel. Okay, here are some of the examples of uh, tests that we use for characterizing properties of steel. We have mechanical testing and non-destructive testing. So by far, the uh, most common test is a tensile test. We take a coupon and put it in a machine and pull on it. Uh, we also do toughness testing, hardness testing, and fatigue testing to characterize the, the uh, performance of the steel product. 
when we don't want to damage the product, then we can use uh, non-destructive testing like ultrasonics or radiographics or maybe some dye penetrant. I didn't bother to write that down. But, uh, basically, those are used most often to uh, examine welds after they're made in the shop. And so ultrasonic testing is used uh, sound waves that pass through the steel and they look for imperfections. Radiographic testing is basically the use of x-rays. So this shows an example of a tensile test, and uh, uh, you guys should all have seen this sort of a thing in your materials of construction class. Um, and basically, we take a steel specimen called a coupon, and we put it in a machine that uses hydraulics, usually hydraulics, to uh, apply attention to it, and we pull on the material until it fails. And we record the displacement and the strain at the same time, and we can develop a stress-strain curve for the material. Okay, the called out here is a load cell that measures the load that's applied. We have a displacement transducer that in this case is buried in the machine. Um, and then we have two hydraulic grips here that make it easier to actually grip the specimen and install it in the machine. This shows a close up of a smaller specimen and this product here in the middle or this instrument in the middle is the uh, it's called a strain transducer. Now remember the definition of strain epsilon is basically the change in length divided by the original length. So using this instrument here you know what the original length is and it measures the change in length and by uh, uh, dividing one by the other you can get the strain. So the uh, specimens that are tested, the, the rate of loading and things of that nature are covered in ASTM E8, which covers all metals, and they're also covered in ASTM A370, which covers steel specifically. The, the coupons that we use could either be flats, like uh, the ones that are shown uh, at the top, or they could be rounds as well. So if you're using round bar, for example, it would be easier to cut a round specimen. If you're uh, looking at a W shape, for example, it's easier to cut a flat specimen. Coupons from rolled sections are cut from the webs of the sections in the direction parallel to the direction of rolling, so parallel to the major length dimension of the product. If you look at the, the strength of steel in the other dimensions, in uh, uh, it can be different. Um, so it's important to specify which direction we cut the coupons in. So usually the direction of rolling is the strongest direction, um, but uh, fortunately for us, it's usually the direction that uh, the load is applied in as well. Either, uh, well, not necessarily the load, but the stresses resulting from the load. So that works out well. This is a typical stress strain curve. Uh, I can't remember which textbook I got this out of. I don't know if it was out of an earlier version of Segui. I scanned it in, you can kind of see the gray around the edge. Uh, or it might be out of Salmon and Johnson, but it shows the, the general characteristic of a stress strain curve. So of importance here is the, uh, the yield stress. This is the yield point here. This is the onset of strain hardening. This is the ultimate strength or the tensile strength of the material. So this is the elastic region, uh, linear elastic region of the material. This is the yield plateau here. This is the strain hardening region here. And then this is the region where you actually see the specimen start to neck down before it fractures. Okay, here is a, 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 a zoomed in version of the a slide similar to the one we showed on the last page. And if you have a, uh, a specimen that's installed very carefully um, and you test it uh, just right, you can actually see different parts of the yield point. So altogether, I would refer to this as the yield point, but we can be more specific than that. We can say that this is the proportional limit. That's the point at which the material no longer responds in a straight line. This is the elastic limit. This is the upper yield point. This is the lower yield point. You it's you don't see that in all cases typically when you're testing steel you try and test it at a high rate of speed you get a uh you could do more tests in the same amount of time plus the material shows a higher yield point if you test it faster and you don't always uh, uh see all of these details but it's important to understand the difference between the upper yield point and the lower yield point so basically as the material comes up along its uh um, elastic range, it actually reaches the upper yield point, and then it dips down to a lower yield point, and then it moves on to the, the yield plateau. So um, 
One common way of uh, determining what the actual yield stress is here, instead of you know taking the upper yield point or the lower yield point, you actually take a line and you uh, create a parallel, a line that's parallel to the elastic region. So if this is the elastic response of the steel shown here, then what we do is we shift that line over. So if we had a rolling ruler and we shift that over by some amount, that dimension is usually uh, a dimension at 0 0.002 strain, and strain is dimensionless. So that is actually equal to 0.2%. So we have a line that is offset by 0.2%. So we refer to this point up here at the top. Let me get the red pen color. So this right here would be, let's see, and then we strike that over here to the axis on the left. And this would be F sub Y, that would be the 0.2% yield stress for that material. And I think you're asked to do this in one of your homework assignments. All right, now from, the, um, when we, from a design point of view, when we look at steel, there's a lot of different characteristics that we need to know. Uh, the yield stress is uh, usually the most important, but also the tensile strength is important as well, or the ultimate strength, F sub U. Modulus of elasticity is um, taken as uh, constant for all grades of steel. So E is taken as 29,000 KSI, regardless of the grade of steel that you have. The shear modulus of elasticity, G, is taken as 11,200 KSI, uh, regardless of the uh, type of steel you have. And then the strain hardening modulus is uh, not something we usually use uh, um, explicitly, nor is the percent elongation, but it's important to know that our steel has ductility and the percent elongation and fracture is a measure of that ductility. So this is a slide that shows actual stress strain data for a grade 50 steel. This is ASTM A572 grade 50. We tested this here at UC. Um, probably back in the 2008 timeframe. And um, it gives you an indication of exactly uh, the proportions between the, the elastic portion of the response, the yield plateau, the strain hardening region, and then the, uh, the necking and fracture region. So you can see this would be an upper yield point here. There's a lower yield point buried in there. This is basically the yield plateau here. This is the strain hardening region. This is the necking region there. This material over here, or this data rather, is uh, shown in a different color because we took the strain transducer off of the uh, specimen um, at this point because we didn't want the fracture of the specimen to damage the strain transducer or the extensometer. So that's, we had to fit that in there using data from the, uh, the displacement transducer in the, in the machine as opposed to using the extensometer. A lot of times when we're working with the steel, we don't use the actual stress strain response for the steel though. It's a little bit more complicated than we need for uh, most of our designs. So we often idealize the response of the, uh, the steel using an elastic, perfectly plastic curve. So basically uh, we just account for the elastic region and then the yield plateau. And we say that the uh, steel response is bilinear and we discount the strain hardening region, the necking region, et cetera. In some cases, when we need to be a little bit more specific, then we'll use a trilinear representation, three lines, trilinear. So we have an elastic region, we have a uh, yield plateau, and then we have the strain hardening region. And a lot of times the strain hardening modulus, E sub S, is approximated as 2% uh, of the elastic modulus, E. This shows the stress strain response of a number of different grades of steel. So the lowest curve is a grade 36 steel, A36. Uh, that would be a carbon steel, a mild steel, different words for the same thing. The middle curve is uh, grade 50 steel, uh, high strength, low alloy, HSLA steel. And uh, that's the one that you would uh, commonly see for W shapes. Grade 36 steel would be used for angles and for channels by default, but you can get uh, angles and channels in grade 50 steel as well. 
Um, and then the upper curve is for 100 KSI steel, and we wouldn't use that very much in structural engineering. Uh, it would be relatively rare to use a steel that's uh, 100 KSI. Um, there are other intermediate grades of steel. You can get grade 60 or grade 70 steel that's used more and more commonly now. Grade 70 steel is common in bridges, um, and you can see some columns that uh, uh, that are made out of W shapes rolled from uh, either grade, I think it's 65 or grade 70 steel. So one thing to note is um, all of these steels, regardless of the grade, have the same elastic modulus, right? So the uh, the uh, slope portion of the curve over here on the left is the same. So let me see if I can sketch that in. No, that's not what I want. There we go. <clears throat> and the 0.2% the offset method becomes more important with stronger steels um, because you need a method to uh, identify the yield point when there isn't an apparent yield point. So note here for the 36 grade steel and the 50 grade steel, there's an apparent yield point there, uh, but up here for the uh, 100 KSI steel or the stronger steel, there's no apparent upper yield point. So you need a repeatable way of identifying the yield point there, the yield stress, and that's where the 0.2% offset becomes more important. Also note that the ductility you get uh, is uh, rather good for the uh, grade 36 and grade 50 steel, but when you get to higher strength steels, that ductility is limited uh, compared to the, the uh, carbon steel or the HSLA steel. Now, that particular uh, trend is illustrated in this slide as well. We have A36 steel again here. We have A572 grade 50 steel. Here's the weathering steel, A588. A913 is a, a grade of steel that's used for plates. A709 is a bridge steel, etc. A514 would be like 100 KSI steel. But one thing to note is that as you increase the strength of the steel, you have a decreasing ductility in the steel as well. So there's a relationship there that's not uh, quantitative, but it's certainly qualitative that as you increase the strength of the steel, you have a reduction in the ductility. That ductility is not something that we design for explicitly, but uh, a level of ductility is assumed in the development of the design specifications that we use for steel. Aside from tensile testing, another common test that's used to characterize material properties is a toughness test. Specifically, a Sharpie V-notch test is used to determine the notch toughness of the material. That's the ability of the material to uh, resist a sudden fracture. Sharpie is the person who developed the test, and uh, the V and the notch come from the idea that there is a specimen with a small notch pre-made pre in it that's shaped like a V. That uh, specimen is placed inside of a test machine uh, in an anvil. And then you have a hammer that's raised to a starting position with a known potential energy. That hammer is then released and swings through the specimen, imparting some of the energy into the specimen when it fractures, and then uh, reaches a lower potential energy on the upswing on the other side. The difference in potential energy from the starting position to the end position is basically the amount of energy that is required to fracture that specimen and that is reported as the, uh, the toughness of the material. The toughness of the material has, is different for different temperatures. If you have a specimen that's tested at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, it will have a higher notch toughness than a specimen that's tested at, say, zero degrees Fahrenheit. So typically, the toughness isn't reported as a single value. It's usually reported as a uh, an energy level at a certain temperature, or as the last item here says, it's uh, presented on a uh, toughness transition temperature curve. This is an example of a toughness transition temperature curve and is the result of a number of different toughness tests that are conducted at different temperatures. So typically you would go into a laboratory, you would conduct uh, tests at different temperatures, and you would see a bunch of different data points like this. Um, it's a bit extreme, perhaps. You probably wouldn't conduct tests at so many different temperatures. But then you would fit a line to it, like this uh, black line that's shown here. And you could see that there is a transition in toughness from a warmer temperature to a toughness at a lower temperature. 
So say out here at a temperature of about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, you might have a toughness of 50 foot pounds. Whereas down here at a temperature of zero degrees Fahrenheit, you're looking at a, a toughness of about 10 foot pounds. So that's important to us. We need to know um, what that uh, range of toughness is. If it's a bridge type structure that's uh, erected in Alaska, then uh, it's important to know that our material might not have the same toughness in the winter as it does in the summer. And it might uh, mean that that material should be excluded for use in bridges in Alaska. But that same material might be just fine in Puerto Rico or in uh, Florida. So anyways, um, toughness is uh, also an important measure. Um, we use Sharpie V-notch toughness testing and the toughness of the material is a function of the temperature. Hardness testing is also common, but it isn't as important. It's not a uh, as tensile strength or as toughness. It's not a primary consideration for us. Um, toughness can be, I'm sorry, hardness can be correlated to strength, though. So in some cases where we have material that can't be tested in, in a tensile strength in a tensile test, we can test the hardness of the material and then get an idea of what the strength is based on that hardness. So we have a number of different scales that we use, a Rockwell scale, a Brunel scale, and a Vickers scale. The Rockwell scale is the most common, and the Rockwell test consists of using a steel or a carbide sphere that's pressed into the steel with a specified force, and the hardness is reported as the depth of the indentation that's left. Okay, um, there's uh, also the Brunel, which is uh, similar to the Rockwell, except that a carbide sphere is pressed into the steel with a specified force and then the hardness is reported as the force divided by the surface area of the indentation. So similar but uh, a little bit more complex to figure out what that surface area is. And then if you're dealing with a very hard material, um, then uh, you might use a Vickers test where you have a, di a diamond shaped pyramid that's uh, a diamond pyramid rather that's pressed into the steel uh, with a specified force for a predetermined length of time and the hardness is reported as the force divided by the projected area of the resulting indentation. So typically we use uh, Rockwell for most of our steel so you might see uh, Rockwell B scale or Rockwell C scale depending on the particular steel that you're looking at. So uh, the different scales are needed because you know plastic and brass and steel and aluminum they all have very uh, uh, greatly varying levels of hardness. The apparatus shown on this slide, the apparati, the apparatuses shown on this slide are a couple of different hardness testers. Um, the one on the left is a digital uh, tester and the one on the right is analog. Uh, basically, they both have a means of measuring force and uh, either the amount of displacement or indentation uh, or another mechanism to figure out what the uh, surface area is. So we have one of these in the high bay lab, but we don't use it very often and probably not a part of uh, anything that you did in your materials of construction class. So the last type of testing that we'll talk about is fatigue testing. And I would say that this type of testing is rather rare or uncommon for uh, a typical uh, engineering design project. We could do this type of testing for development of specification language or maybe the qualification of new types of materials. But for you to do this as uh, part of a routine design would be, be rather uncommon. Basically, though, we have a specimen that's called a trouser leg specimen, because if you were to rotate it uh, 90 degrees clockwise, it would look like a pair of trousers. Right. Um, but basically, there's a. Uh, uh, a notch that's cut into the material uh, at the beginning uh, using some kind of like a, a wire EDM or maybe a laser cutter or something like that. And then the test machine uh, just imposes a cyclic tension that uh, ultimately leads to a fatigue crack. And the fatigue crack is uh, outlined here. It basically starts there at the point of uh, concentrated stress. And that crack actually develops and grows uh, from right to left in the screen. And the rate of crack growth can be correlated to the toughness of the material. And uh, uh, then this could be used to evaluate whether the material is acceptable under fatigue consideration or uh, can be used to develop specification language or things of that nature. Now that we have a general understanding of the behavior of steel, let's address the question of which grades of steel should we be using in our designs? 
The best answer to that question is to look in the AISC Steel Construction Manual at the end of Chapter 2 in Table 2-4 or Table 2-5. A screenshot of table 2-4 is shown here on this slide, and if you take a broad look at the table, you'll see that the grades of steel are broken down by their overall type, carbon steel, high strength, low alloy steel, and corrosion resistant steel. Next, you'll see that the grades are broken down by their specific ASTM designations. A36 as an example of carbon steel, A572 grade 50, or A992 as examples of high strength, low alloy steels, and A709 as an example of corrosion resistant quenched and tempered steel. Next, the yield stress F sub Y and tensile stress F sub U are given for each of those grades of steel. In most of the cases, they're given as a single number, which represents the minimum specified value for that material. In other cases, however, those values are given as a range, say 58 to 80 KSI for the tensile stress of A36 steel, for example. In those cases, you would typically design for the lower of the two values. Finally, across the top of each table, you'll see that there are applicable shapes listed. You can see that there are wide flange shapes, miscellaneous eye shapes, H piles, channels, miscellaneous channels, angles, and hollow structural sections. When an engineer uses this chart to select a material, the first thing that they would do is identify the structural shape that they're planning to use for a given application. Let's suppose, for example, that we're going to use a W section. In that case, we would look in the column in the table that corresponds to the W section and look for the cell that's shaded in as black. That cell represents the preferred material grade for that particular shape. For the W section, for example, you can see that there is only one box that is shaded black, indicating that A992 is the preferred material for the W section. That's not to say that W sections aren't available in other material grades. You could also get the W shape in A572 grade 50 since this cell is shaded in in gray. But the W section is most commonly available in grade A572 grade 50. Consider the HP as another example. The H pile is also available in A992, but the preferred material is A572 grade 50. Considering hollow structural sections as another example, if you're designing with a rectangular and a round section, then the preferred material is A500 grade C. But those sections are also available as A1085 as well. If you're using a pipe section, however, then the preferred material is A53 grade B. Table 2-4 represents one of the biggest changes in the 16th edition of the manual. This slide shows a comparison of Table 2-4 from the 16th edition of the manual with the same table in the 15th edition and older editions of the manual. In the 15th edition of the manual, A36 was listed as the preferred material for several of the shapes, including channels, angles, miscellaneous eye shapes, and standard eye shapes. With the release of the 16th edition of the manual, you can see that A36 isn't a preferred material for any of those rolled shapes, and in fact, all shapes are listed with a preferred material of having a 50 KSI yield stress now, with the exception of pipe sections. It's worth noting here as well that this change also has significant ramifications on the design tables throughout the rest of the manual. Table 2-5 applies to plates and bars instead of rolled structural sections. As you can see, this table is laid out generally the same way as Table 2-4 with respect to carbon steel, high strength low alloy steel, and with respect to corrosion resistant weathering steels. However, when we look at the top of the table, instead of seeing different structural shapes listed, we see different thicknesses listed. As you can see here, either A36 or A572 grade 50 are the preferred materials for plate thicknesses up to 4 inches, unless you're using the plate for connecting elements, in which case grade 50 is preferred. Note that A572 grade 50 isn't available for plate thickness the plates thicker than four inches, leaving only A36 as a preferred material. And note that for plates thicker than eight inches, which aren't really all that common, the yield stress of the material drops from 36 KSI to 32 KSI. 
One final note, these A709 quenched and tempered plates are commonly used for built up bridge girders. So while the corresponding cells are shaded in as gray, they should be readily available for the most part, at least for grades 50 and 70. The next table in the manual is table 2-6, which applies to structural fasteners. We're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit here, but this particular table outlines which grades uh, and styles of fasteners are available and are applicable to which different applications. We'll revisit this table later in the semester when we get uh, into our discussion about connections. So the last couple of tables in chapter two deal with surface preparation standards, and that's a, a bit of a right turn for this particular lecture, but uh, it's worth mentioning, and this is as good a place as any, I suppose. Um, SSPC um, stands for what, the Society of Protective Coatings, something Society for Protective Coatings, and they have uh, SP1, SP2, SP3, et cetera, which stand for surface preparation level one, surface preparation level two, surface preparation level three. So when you're specifying steel for a project, you might want it just to be um, uh, solvent cleaned, for example. Maybe you want it to be cleaned with a power tool. Maybe you want it to be pickled. Uh, maybe you want it to be uh, cleaned and painted with a primer. So um, these different surface preparations give us a means of uh, specifying different uh, surface preps uh, on uh, 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 construction documents that uh, are easily understood by everybody involved. All right, now I wanted to mention that uh, there are a lot of different cross sections that are available in the AISC manual. Not all of them are available for use, however. I don't know how many are actually in the manual. There might be a thousand, but my guess is that if there are a thousand sections available, there's probably only three or 400 of them that uh, you could actually order and have on a job site at any given time. So just because they're in the manual doesn't mean that there are actually steel mills producing them. So it would be unfortunate if you uh, put together a design for your project only to find out that this, the cross sections or the shapes that you specified weren't available for a fabricator or a rector to actually build the, the, the structure out of. So AISC maintains a database of availability for shapes, and uh, you can navigate to it using the URL that's shown here. And when you get to that section or that uh, web page, what you'll do is uh, enter the uh, um, enter the cross section you're interested in, say a W21 by 44 in this instance. And if we enter the data for W21 by 44, uh, hit the submit button, then you get these results. And you can see that W21 by 44 is available in grade A992 and in grade A709. It's rolled by four different steel mills. Uh, three of those are AISC member uh, producers, um, Ameristeel, Nucor Yamato, and Steel Dynamics. And then you have Arxelor Middle, which is not an AISC member. So the fact that this uh, particular cross section, the 21 by 44, is rolled by four different steel mills is a good indication that you're going to be able to get that on your job uh, when you need it. If it wasn't rolled by any steel mills or if it was only rolled by one, for example, then you would want to uh, maybe look into it a bit further uh, before you specified that particular cross section. How would you do that? Well, if we click on the new core Yamato link down at the bottom, then uh, that's this link right here. Then what that does is it takes us to their web page where you can look up a rolling schedule and see um, when the W21 by 44 is scheduled to be rolled. This is a rolling schedule for Nucor Yamato. And uh, I don't have too much experience reading these, but if you look here, you can see the 21 by 44 is scheduled to be rolled during the week of September 6th, I think, and then possibly again during the week of October 25th. Um, so uh, I'm not sure what all of the little designations mean, but uh, this is what a rolling schedule looks like. So um, if you end up working for a fabricator, then you'll probably deal with these a little bit more than you would if you were actually working um, as a uh, structural engineer. Okay, that brings us to the end of this lecture.
Hopefully by now you have an idea of the different cross sections and shapes that are available for use in structural steel buildings and bridges. And uh, you have an idea of the different uh, types of ma uh, material testing that the steel is subjected to and the material properties that you're going to use as structural engineers. All right, thanks.